Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Chapnell. I'm the executive director of Hermosa del Barrio. Welcome to the very intimate guide tour to the, the Dialogos section in Frist Art Fair, New York. Uh, let me introduce you to curators Susana Tenkin and Rodrigo Moura, who will be guiding this experience. I would like to thank our sponsor, Tequila Dobel, who has supported not only in this occasion, but the Museo del Barrio in different uh, times. So welcome everyone and please enjoy uh, Dialogos. Hello, hi, uh, good evening everyone. So it's my pleasure to be here today with Patrick and Susanna. Together we curated Dialogos uh, for its uh, second year. Of course, this is a completely new situation for everyone. For the first time, the fair, due to the pandemics, the, for the first time, the whole fair uh, is uh, happening on, on, as an online platform, as viewing rooms. Uh, so today, we will be doing this tour uh, that um, we would do uh, in, in, in uh, flash, if, we, if the fair was happening, but we're doing uh, with using the viewing room. So thanks everyone for joining us. And thanks also Suzanne and Patrick for the partnership on this. Uh, so uh, if I may just start by saying a few words about the section in general, uh, I would like to say that this is, as I said, the second year of this collaboration between uh, Freeze and El Museo del Barrio. El Museo as the leading institution, uh, of uh, Lat Latino and Latin American art in the United States uh, proposes this solo presentations by 12 different artists, uh, both working in the US and in Latin America. So in terms of what's new in this uh, year's iteration of the section compared to last year's, uh, I would say that, of course, Patrick and, and um, Susanna did a great job last year but I wanted to add more as a newcomer to the team. So what, it, what we try to do is to make it much more multi-generational, much more uh, things that were already present and, and dealing with different cultural backgrounds uh, and trying to stress out themes as indigeneity, identity, um, uh, working across media generations and uh, cultural backgrounds and geographic locations. So this is, for me, very important to say that this is part of the vision that we are creating for the curatorial programs at El Museo. So uh, it's some, some of the things that we will see here are, uh, resonate to some of the artists or themes or exhibitions that we're proposing for El Museo's program, without necessarily being the same artist, but just uh, having uh, different uh, interests in common, right? So I will start by uh, walking you through the, some, of the, some of the sections, and then I'll, I'll hand it to Susanna Temkin, uh, so she will complement this presentation. Uh, but also, uh, let me ask you also to uh, mute your computer so we avoid any background noise. And I'm actually very happy to start by Almeida Andeo, Galeria de Arte. Almeida Andeo is an important secondary market gallery based in Sao Paulo, who's doing a lot of uh, curated exhibitions um, and in partnership also with different galleries in the country. So they, I would say they hold a quite a unique presence uh, as being uh, like a classic secondary market gallery, but also doing partnerships with different galleries and, 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 and collections and even museums in, in Brazil. So uh, we invited them to participate with Mestre Gigi. Uh, and that was um, very, I mean, for me, very important uh, participation in this year's section because Mestre Gigi was a very high, uh, highly graduated priest in the Candomblé 
tradition in Brazil. He was actually, he was the, the supreme uh, priest in the cult of the Egunguns, which is a specific cult in Candomblé. So he was born in, the, he was the son of a very graduated lady, my, uh, my menina. But anyway, so this is, this presentation was put together by Ahmed Day in, in collaboration with Galeria Paulo Darzé from Salvador. And it's, uh, it's really a wonderful um, selection of these um, sculptures that Master Gigi had created and has created and, and presented between the 1960s and the early 2000s in Brazil. So he was, just to give you some context background, on Mestre Gigi, he was one of the few Brazilians that was included in Magicien de la Terre. And if you, if you know the history of exhibitions a little bit, Magicien de la Terre was a groundbreaking exhibition organized by the Pompidou Centre in Paris in 1989 by Jean-Hubert Martin. And so together with Sildo Meirelles, who's, a, by the way, another participating artist at this year's Dialogos, they were the two Brazilian artists included in that show. So Gigi, Master Gigi started to do those sculptures in the context of Candomblé as ritualistic objects. And he was also a very, very important researcher of the Nago and Yoruba traditions in Brazil. But then in the 60s, he started to, he was actually granted permission by his santo, which is like the, uh, one of the names given to the, like general names given to the deities, the orishas in Brazil, his santo uh, gave him, granted him permission to create and exhibit these works outside the ritualistic context and within the art world. So what we see here is a quite extraordinary presentation. Uh, he was representing especially some of the orishas that were uh, important to, to the cult that he was uh, the, the supreme priest of. And these are orishas related to the forces of nature. So you, when you see the employment of the, this iconography or these emblems of the symbols, we see like a bird here, we see snakes very often, uh, but also this form, for instance, is a direct reference to Nana, who was a female orisha. And so this curve that we see, this very elegant, beautiful curves that we see in his work, they relate in this case with Nana, but they relate to the orisha symbology in general. So in the case of Nana, it's really, what we see is really an uterus. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a part of the female body and it's, uh, it's a beautiful evocative way to connect Mother Earth with, with the feminine, uh, ancestrality, right? So just moving forward then to Sildo Meirelles. Sildo is also a very dear artist to me. Uh, we're doing this in the order of their website. So uh, by coincidence, we're starting with the two, with the two Brazilian galleries and artists that, re that are represented. So with Sildo, we collaborated with Luisa Strina. Luisa is a fantastic, uh, gallery in Latin America and in Sao Paulo, uh, doing, uh, w representing the work of Sildo since 1981. So this is like a, like a lifelong relationship between gallery and artist. And Sildo is I mean, probably one of the most influential artists of his generation just globally today. He's someone who had shows in major museums like the Tate Modern and uh, uh, the Macba in Barcelona and several others. Uh, but what we created with Luisa and, and, and her team is a presentation of several multiple works by Sildo. But not, not only that, 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 but also trying to represent the idea of multiplicity, multiplicity uh, in his work. So we see, what we see on the top here is a, uh, it's like a multi, multi-object presentation of the metros, right? And these are this sort of disoriented objects that he creates uh, that uh, comes from rulers or, or, or 
ruling systems and measurement system uh, systems that he recreates and that he reinterprets uh, by recombining the same element over and over. So throughout the presentation, we see several of his more recent multiples, like this, uh, this unpaired pairs, which is this, uh, this pair of glasses. So he's really playing with the, ideas of, with the idea of the pairs and the reflections. Uh, so this is a work uh, that's relatively recent. The Invisible Sphere, that's also another very important work from his, uh, from his multiples and edition works. We have also some uh, drawings, very unique and rare drawings from the 1970s, as with this uh, drawing from 1973, where we see he's using his fingerprint as uh, almost like a matrix to create uh, like a multiple, the same goes for the this this animal prints, this animal patterns. So it's it's really like a mini survey of Sildo's work uh, or this wonderful multiple of uh, that multiples that we see on this on this part of the section of the presentation that refer to larger scale installations of his, like the eggs with America and the clocks with uh, fortunes the. In Motos, the end of the presentation, we see some of the, the bank bill, the bank notes, uh, both the ones where he would stamp message onto and return back to circulation, or the ones that he created in the 70s, like the zero dollar or the zero cruzeiro, which was then Brazilian currency. Uh, also, dealing another time in this case uh, with. Uh, system of representation through economics. So this is the zero real, which is current Brazilian currency. And this is the zero dollar that's, uh, it's, uh, it's a project from the 1970s. And of course we have here the zero cent as well. So just moving forward, uh, Nora Fish is a gallery. Uh, and by the way, just a short commercial break. I encourage you all to return to the viewing rooms and spend time uh, other than this tour, seeing the, the presentations. And also there's the, there's like, a, like a, a functionality here where you can sign their presence book. And that's a way to make the, those presentations more uh, humane and you know, to express you know, this, your presence there, to make sure your presence uh, there is uh, not a notice. So you, th these are works by Adriana Bustos created uh, the last 10 years, I would say. Adriana is one of the most fascinating artists to me, uh, uh, emerged in this great generation of Argentinian artists based in Buenos Aires that emerged in the late 90s, early 2000s. So with Adriana, we have uh, those bestiarios, those maps. So what Adriana does is this really kaleidoscope views, world views, as I like to call them. And they draw from a tradition of, of representation that goes back to medieval times, to, to middle age. So some of them are titled Imago Mundi, and they have this very uh, entangled or, or very intricate uh, representations of like touristic maps. In this case, she's examining uh, how Miami, on the image on, I guess, your left, uh, how Miami became such an important uh, tourist destination. So she, and so she creates this sort of almost diagrammatic uh, kaleidoscopic views by using drawing, by using text pattern and other um, visual uh, methods of, of, of representation and of di this discourse. So also interesting to point out this new body of works that Adriana's uh, that Adriana has prepared for the section. 
this is called the burning books and that what she's doing is this uh, beautiful assemblage of both uh, hand, drew, hand drew or hand painted or photograph reproduction of book covers of books that have been censored uh, and that have been put in different uh, banning lists or indexes throughout history, both in back in the days and, and more recently by the church, by authoritarian regimes in the world. So what she creates here are these panels of, um, of, of almost like memorials to freedom of speech of, of um, different books and their covers through different books and their covers. So uh, I'd like to just move forward to, to Ruiz Hilliard. And that's, that's also one of the wonderful things that it's part of the Alagos is to really devote a strong focus to Latino, Latinx artists uh, practicing in the U.S. and with this uh, presentation we collaborated with Ruiz Healy Art. It's a very important gallery in Texas, in San, based in San Antonio, that uh, have worked with different generations of Tejano, of Texas-based Mexican or Mexican-American artists. So in this case we we are very, very proud to be presenting a selection of more recent uh, portraits by Cesar Martinez. Cesar is, has been creating this series of both uh, female and male portraits of, um, of people since the 1970s. As, of, as a matter of fact, he participated at an of an exhibition at the El Museo in the mid, uh, mid, mid 1980s called Mira, where he presented already this uh, paintings from the series, they called the Batos or the Pachuco series. And so these are very meticulous uh, renditions, pre representations of common types, right? So they are not specifically portraits of anyone, but they are common types that he had encountered through his life as this very, I would say, uh, archetypical figure of the, 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 the Batos and the Pachucos. So very beautifully also there has been some amazing drawings included. I visited Cesar when I was uh, in San Antonio back in February this year, I guess, uh, when it was still possible to take a jet and go somewhere else. Uh, and I, I spent some time with him in his studio and I browsed through his uh, files of drawings to, to help informing the selection of these works. And, and these are magnificent, very, very, very beautiful drawings. And what fascinates me the most about this work is how he really creates this idea of, out of this idea of repetition, right? So, when we were talking about his art, we shared uh, notes about some of the artists that I think wouldn't make sense in relation to his work. And I brought up the name of uh, Francis Bacon, and he really responded to that. So this idea of the repetition of this very sort of set, very set compositions with very little uh, changes, in gesture, in posture, in position, that makes this work, you know, of repetition, of seriality, very beautiful and very poetic, as we can see from these images. And I asked him about the backgrounds because he's a master in the use of color, as we can see, you know, in this beautiful chords of color, combinations of colors. And I asked him about the colors in the background and he said, Oh, but these are not backgrounds. These are part of the paintings, right? I mean, so the backdrop, the background is also plays a major, major role uh, as almost like monochromes that are in intimate dialogue with the more representational aspect of uh, this painting. And speaking of portraiture, 
uh, we, we did try to really create dialogues uh, um, amongst these works and uh, Cesar's paintings, they, uh, they really talk about gender and race in a very uh, sophisticated way. And so does uh, uh, David Antonio Cruz, who's the next artist I'm presenting uh, to today. So David is showing his work with Monique Meloche, who represents his work. Uh, and it's a, it's a gallery based in Chicago. And me and Susanna, we were doing research in September to, with the patrons trip to, in September to, to Chicago. And we had the chance to see this beautiful show of, of David that we can see an installation view of. And this, so he, he, he is continuously creating work around this research that he started maybe two, three years ago around uh, portraiture, which is of course core to his practice. El Museo has a really, really wonderful self-portrait of David's in his collection as a, is the Puerto Rican Pieta. It's one of the most beloved uh, contemporary works in our permanent collection. But this is this body of work here continues uh, David's exploration on, on gender and race and specifically on queer uh, histories within the Latinx community. And that speaks of intersectionality, which is a very important aspect of just understanding uh, Latinx um, as a term, as a gender neutral term. And these are, most of them are portraits that were created by David uh, departing from internet images that he researches and sources around uh, homophobic and, and transphobic violence in the United States. So what these portraits are ultimately are really uh, memorials or acts of rem remembrance and, and grieving and mourning. Uh, so you see some of these beautiful, beautiful portraits uh, where he represents the victims of such hideous crimes uh, in a very beautiful, poetic way, using uh, sometimes mediating by uh, like uh, picture frames or, or framed pictures of other kinds, uh, reflections, mirrors, and so on, masks. Uh, so you see here, there's one figure holding another figure through this um, framed picture, but also holding a mask to cover his face or their face. So we were really t talking, and with David, uh, I think Susanna will also talk a little bit more about that, but we, are, we did a few interviews with participating the artists uh, of Dialogos, and David's one of them, and we discuss uh, lengthy the, the use of the face, the use of the mask as a resource, as a, uh, as a element in his uh, portraiture work. So just moving forward, uh, I would like to introduce my last uh, presentation. So today, so Walden Gallery, it's also based in Buenos Aires doing a lot of, it's a gallery that really special, I have worked with them in the past, and they really specialize in visual poetry and, and conceptual art. And, um, and when we say conceptual art, we're not talking about uh, the more uh, Northern hemispheric version of conceptual art, but, but about the conceptualismos that were present in different parts of Latin America uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. So they are really participating with one key figure on this context, which is uh, Ulises Carrion, Mexico, uh, Mexican artist, Mexico-born artist, but who also developed a very important part of his practice being based in Amsterdam. Uh, and, and Carrion is really a pioneer, a very central figure in the male art movement. Uh, so this was a moment where artists uh, was, were really pushing the, 
the boundaries of the institution, the boundaries of the art world, the boundaries of the art object, really challenging the very existence of, uh, of the art experience outside the confines of the institution or the confines of the object making or picture or image making. That's very interesting because we're living something similar during these times. And I think Mayo Art was really forcing or anticipating several of these questions in a beautiful way. So also visual poetry is a very strong component of Carrion's uh, practice. And Walden put together a, a really uh, beautiful presentation uh, where we see a lot of these compositions using um, typewriting. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but also pictures of his archive. It's, it's very interesting. These are the composition I was referring to where he employs the alphabet. He decomposes the alphabet by creating this geometric compositions, inserting numeric, a, a numeric system within this grid created by, by the alphabetic system. So these are like gorgeous, gorgeous uh, typewritten uh, works that he created uh, in the in the late 1970s, really responding to a legacy of concrete poetry, of visual poetry that is so important uh, to the whole Latin American experience in the arts post-war, in the post-war arts. So, uh, so this is this is a, a gorgeous series, and I think it's really interesting to understand the role of books and artist books and archives. So the same way that uh, the male art created a system, a network between different people uh, working in different parts of the world and sending back and forth their correspondence. And Ulysses Carrion really uh, went very deep in this idea of correspondence, other systems of communication, such as gossip, such as music uh, and, and verbal compositions. Uh, but this is, this is a gorgeous um, artist book that he created when he was living in Amsterdam in the 70s. He was also working as a, as a publisher and as an archivist. As, and these are part of his intrinsic to his artistic practice. And this, this, this um, has a very nice title. Allow me to read it to you. Tell me what sort of wall, wallpaper your room has and I will tell you who you are. So he was collecting these scraps of wallpaper uh, sheets and inserting uh, this very sort of simple or, or abbreviated senses, sentences on top of it. La habitación de mi hermana, la habitación del psiquiatra, de mi psiquiatra, and so on. So these are almost like anthropomorphic uh, or, or portraits of figurative presentations of, or, or representations of people through just words and the patterns he would encounter on this uh, pre-existing wallpapers that he sourced in the streets of Amsterdam. So these are my uh, six uh, presentations. I really encourage us to have a conversation uh, after we finish here. And without much further, I'll pass the word to Susanna. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me as I load up um, the Dialogo section. Uh, it might be virtual, but hopefully you haven't gotten any fair fatigue yet because we have six more artists to show you um, and I hope you'll stick around for them all. Um, just to start, uh, we'll start with Galleria Patricia Reddy from Chile, our southernmost um, gallery participant in this year's Dialogos. Oh, and I wanted to mention that um, it's great to have you all with us and that um, one of our participating galleries from last year, Proxico, I see that we have um, Laura here. So it's great to have last year's Dialogos uh, participants here and we hope to continue to grow this uh, as the years go on. 
So, um, Galeria Patricia Reddy, as Rodrigo mentioned, we do hope that you'll come back and visit the section a few times. Uh, I really want to highlight this section because uh, there's a lot of information that's embedded within um, this particular gallery. So, um, the gallery is showcasing the work of Valuspa Jagpa, a Chilean artist whose work is very much rooted in the archival. Um, and a lot of what you'll see in this presentation, um, which all draws on works produced from 2014 on, um, you'll see that Voluspa is very interested in investigating, especially CIA records. Uh, so I wanted to point out these first two works in the gallery, um, the Judd Vertical and the Judd Kubos, because of course, um, it's interesting to think about these being presented in New York Freeze at the same time as the major Judd retrospective is happening at MoMA. So, you know, you can zoom between a Freeze viewing room and look at um, Jagba's response to what Judd is doing and then visit over at our neighbor, um, the Museum of Modern Art. Um, this uh, video that you see on the left, translation lesson, lessons, uh, I think it's also, it's a really interesting, almost an introduction in a way to um, the artist's work because it really gets to the heart of her interest in, well, semiotics, but also her interest in digging into the records and really dissecting information. So um, this particular video, which I believe you can watch a snippet of um, if you come back and visit, you'll see that the artist has been trying to learn English via the writer Nicolas, Nicolas Poblete. Um, and so this is a record of her learning English, but learning it by translating CIA records once again. So again, this, this deep-seated interest in investigating these um, once censored files. And I just want to point out there's so many works in this uh, particular show. It's like a little retrospective or, or recent works. Um, but this image that you see on your right, the foundation of the Banana Republic, it's a very interesting installation with the multi-channel videos in which the artist actually uses um, some of the footage that the United Fruit Company was using to try and promote um, banana consumption uh, among U.S. audiences. And again, digging into um, different links between the company and uh, and governments involved. So with that, I will move us into our next gallery, um, which is Gallery Louis Sotti. Um, Gallery Louis Sotti is presenting the work of Cristina Fernandez, who is a Chicana photographer. Uh, Rodrigo mentioned that we have been conducting interviews with some of the participants. So I had a really wonderful conversation with Cristina Fernandez that in the coming uh, days, you'll be able to watch a video of. Um, we'll be promoting that through El Museo and through Freeze. Um, but it was very interesting for me to hear that um, Cristina's work, even though she hasn't been to El Museo, but it had been presented, um, this particular series, her Lavanderia series at El Museo as part of the Phantom Sightings collection. Um, so again, if you watch the video, you'll be able to see the installation of this piece. Uh, and this is really one of her most canonical pieces in which she um, takes frontal images of uh, laundromats across the city of Los Angeles. So um, Christina is born and raised in LA, and she says that the city is very much um, the backdrop to all of her work. So she really considers herself actually a landscape photographer. Um, and her photographs are extremely painterly. Um, a lot of times there's multiple layers that uh, she captures through the lens. Uh, I want to point out another work because I feel like it's just so timely, unfortunately, for our current situation. Um, what you're seeing here, this window series, it's actually part of a larger series called Views From Here, in which um, Christina Fernandez goes to visit um, oftentimes artists' homes, and she takes images from the inside looking out um, of the windows. 
So I'm really captivated by um, the image that you see on the left with the pink curtain. Um, this is the view from the fellow Chicana photographer, Laura Aguilar, um, who sadly passed away two years ago. So in a sense, this is an homage to Laura. Um, these are all self-portraits of each of these artists. Uh, but this particular image was taken from Laura's bed. And it really, I think it reiterates, at least with me, as I'm sitting before a window talking to you all, these kind of viewpoints that we're all looking at right now. And um, before I move away from Christina's presentation, I want to talk about um, one more piece because it was very exciting for me to see that this piece would be presented at Freeze New York. Um, what you're seeing in these top two images are from her untitled farm worker um, presentation. This was a presentation that she first created when she was a student, when she was getting first her um, BFA and then she recreated it as um, her MFA. And in it, it was originally an installation dedicated to uh, farm workers who had lost their lives either due to the conditions of pesticides or because of their involvement with um, labor strikes or organizations. Um, so it originated as an installation with dirt on the ground in which these cards, which um, describe the, the names um, and sadly the deaths of these uh, farm workers, almost like a tombstone embedded into the earth. It grew from there into this photography series that you see on the right, which takes on almost um, a minimalist conceptual gesture as well. And then for the first time in 30 years, um, what you see on the left is uh, Christina Fernandez's reconception, reconfiguration, going back to how she would um, choose to install this work today. So uh, what you're seeing in the Gallery Luis Soti booth is very much a retrospective of her work. She's wor uh, Christina will be having an exhibition in a few years, going back through um, all of her different bodies of work. So it's a wonderful way to introduce yourself to this artist if you don't know her already. From there, we'll look at a um, historical artist through the Enrique Faria booth, Alejandro Puente, um, who is a, an artist who actually, he's Argentine, but he actually lived here in New York between 1967 and 1971. Um, and you can see there's many relationships between his work, which uh, shows a systematic exploration, especially of the color system, but he's very much interested in um, thinking about information, thinking about systems, and is influenced and also in conversation with actively himself um, with US-based minimalists and conceptualists, also drawing on color theories of um, Joseph Albers, but for me, what um, I find really so compelling about Puente's work is how he thinks about some of these chromatic systems in terms of um, Amerindian textile production. So uh, I love the very delicate piece on the left, the Sistema Chromatico from 1971, which, you know, it takes on this modernist grid that, you know, we're so used to seeing when we think about um, modern art and uh, interjects it with uh, the thought of um, a textile loom weaving in uh, the primary and the secondary colors um, over and under. Um, in further examples of um, Puente's exploration of some of these Amerindian sources, of course, you can see um, the Nazca, where the title calls out or references this very um, bluntly. This particular work um, is made on cork, and it recalls some of the decorative motifs that you might see on Nazca pottery, for example. And then going back to the top, um, I love, I hope you can see, um, this rainbow-like banner called Unco. Unku, excuse me, um, and uh, Unku is a word that refers to um, an Incan tunic. And so you can see how, uh, again, thinking about this color system, how Puente is really marrying these um, various connections into his practice. So with that, um, 
happy. Uh, a number of these artists, they share common interests in indigeneity, um, and such is the case with the presentation by uh, a joint presentation between um, Kasman Gallery and Theana Projects, which is a, a Mexican gallery that has an outpost here in New York, actually. Um, and what we're seeing here is the work of Tezontle. So Tezontle is a collective of the artists Carlos Matos and Lucas um, Cantu. Um, and their word, the Tezontle, that they've taken on as their name is a, actually a, a Can you hear me? I, I hope you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, it's a Nahuatl word that references a, a, a type of volcanic ash that's known for its red tint. So um, some of that is, uh, is evoked by the words that you're seeing here. Um, they're very experimental. A lot of their work, it, it combines the architectonic as well as the sculptural. Um, they are very interested in pursuing like the limits of what they can do with concrete. So for example, the pieces that you see here um, are made out of concrete and they're very much interested in blending um, these references to uh, Amerindian, indigenous languages combining it with um, the inheritances of um, Mexican modernism. So thinking about artists like, well, even like Diego Rivera, they mentioned Juan O'Gorman, um, Matias Garretts. Um, and so you see a presentation, many of the works uh, on view at the Freeze Viewing Room were created uh, during their residency at Casa Wabi in Oaxaca. So much of what you see is drawn from um, the particular earth that they encountered there. Javi Gupta is showing the work of um, Jose Lerma, another artist that um, some of us encountered on our wonderful patron's trip to Chicago. Um, I think of Jose Lerma, he's very much a trickster. I was really excited to see what he would come up with for Freeze uh, because uh, if you know anything about his work, he once had an exhibition in Detroit, I believe, where he reproduced an art fair. So he, he really is interested in playing with the concept of the art fair. So I was curious to see what he would come up with for us. Um, and what we're seeing is actually, it's a selection of a long-term body of work that Lerma is engaged with. He's a teacher at the Art Institute in Chicago, and he's currently aiming to produce a drawing of every single painting uh, at the Art Institute. So what we're seeing here are um, not drawings, but paintings drawn from the Art Institute's collection, um, all of uh, originally referencing 19th century, 15th through 19th century works by Spanish and Latin American artists. So um, of course on the right, you may be able to tell even though Lerma is really um, playing with the concept of painting, that this is a reference to El Greco. He has references to uh, Goya as well. Um, and something that I think is quite fun about this presentation is um, Kavi Gupta with the artist, they created a mock of what this uh, booth was going to look like. And if you look carefully, that wallpaper, that black and white wallpaper, um, again, is drawn from Lerma's ongoing investigation into the, uh, the art on view at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so, you know, playing with institutional histories um, and again, a, a trickster as I like to think of him. And then I think my final presentation, and then I hope we're very much open to having a dialogue with you all about Dialogos, about what you've seen here, um, is the presentation by Ponce Robles Gallery, um, our only European gallery this year to be included in Dialogos, and they are featuring the work of uh, Karina Aguilera Skowerski. Um, Skowerski is a neighbor of ours here in New York. She lives in New York. She actually has participated in El Museo's um, art residency back in five minutes some years ago. Um, and Karina recently won the Anonymous Was a Woman Award. So, you know, she is getting a lot of recognition lately. 
Um, what you're seeing here are, she's based in, uh, she does a lot of her work based in photography and film. So what you're seeing here are photographic collections in which the artist is thinking about her uh, Ecuadorian uh, lineage. She is an of Afro-Ecuadorian Jewish descent. Um, and she's very much engaged in thinking about uh, ideas of labor, um, technologies. So these two pieces, um, they relate to her ongoing investigation about the railway system in Ecuador. Uh, and you can see that she's embedding archival images that she sourced from various libraries of some of the workers who were involved in physically excavating this land. Um, something that I really like about her work is that um, rather than making this collage very seamless, she actually exposes the seams. So you can really see um, where the source imagery is coming from. And in a way, she's really transgressing uh, the past, the future, gaps in history, losses in history as well. Um, and I just want to show you um, some of her most recent work which is her investigation dedicated to the site of Inga Pirca. So um, Inga Pirca is an ancient site in Ecuador again. And she, a lot of Karina's work, um, she works in long-term series. She creates these very epic videos. And in creating them, she also does a lot of studio work. So some of these, again, photographic collages uh, what we're seeing here are photographs of stones that Karina encountered at the site of Inga Pirka that she then collages into her studio setting and physically embeds her body um, into, into the history of the stones, into the site that is Inga Pirka, questioning um, her own inheritances of what this site means. Some of them are quite funny, as in, um, the Inga Pirka Piedra um, Numero Ocho that you see on the right where she's almost squashed, smothered by this. Um, some of them are very poetic and um, she's currently expanding this into a video called How to Build a Wall. So of course that connects with our contemporary moment uh, and really investigating how how can Incan technologies influence this concept of, of the wall, the ongoing wall that we continue to hear about? So I believe that covers um, the 12 gallery presentations that we have. Uh, Rodrigo and I are open to any questions that you, you might have. If you want to unmute yourself and feel free to, to ask us anything. It sounds like someone came off a mute, so. Well, if there aren't any questions, I mean, we can linger on, um, but we do, we hope you'll come back to visit Dialogos, to visit the other sections of the fair as well, um, to sign some of uh, the gallery guest books. And um, yes, we're very pleased with this year's iteration. Yeah, I would like before we go, I, I, I have uh, first that uh, the section was recognized as one with one gallery as uh, uh, be, be being one of the best booths in the fair, virtual booth. And, um, and at the same time, uh, I would just like to, uh, to highlight the fact that uh, thanks to Dialogos, uh, now Latinx and Latin American art has much more visibility in the context of the, this very important international art fair. So um, I, I, I celebrate the fact that uh, Fries uh, decided to invite El Museo del Barrio to curate this section and the fact that uh, Latinx and Latin American art has an important presence in the context of a very important international event. We have a question here from Elisa Ramos. Uh, thank you for a question, Elisa, and hello. Um, about the curatorial process, if we can talk about the curatorial process. Um, 
Would you like to start, uh, Patrick, because you initiated with Susanna last year? I'm happy to share your thoughts too. Well, uh, uh, this is the second uh, edition of Dialogos uh, in Fritz Art Fair, New York. Uh, when we were invited, precisely I was, as I was explaining, the purpose was to uh, give a presence and give a voice to Latinx and Latin American artists. But uh, the idea was to precisely establish a, a dialogue, a discussion between uh, Latin America and Latino artists. To, to show the connections and also the difference between the production that uh, comes from uh, uh, Latinos in, in different areas of the US and also uh, uh, different uh, artists that, that work uh, in different uh, cultural contexts in Latin America. So this is was more or less the, the reason why uh, we started this section. And, um, and I, I have to say that uh, it, it's been quite successful. I think uh, it has had a, a, a strong response with uh, the general public. Um, and I don't know, Susanna, if you want to add something. You, you started with me last year, uh, Dialogos. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I think is interesting and that I think um, this section is aiming to, uh, to help with and to change um, is the fact that especially Latinx artists, but Latin American artists as well, um, aren't necessarily as visible on the global contemporary art scale. Um, so that's been very interesting for us to, um, to be able to showcase some of these voices. Um, something that's really interesting is that we have learned that, you know, some Latinx artists don't have gallery representation. So that's something that we've been thinking about with each iteration of the fair. Um, we're really pleased this year by um, the inclusion of artists like David Antonio Cruz and Karina Skaversky, both of whom have ties with El Museo, which is just a bonus. Um, and Rodrigo, I'm curious what you think as sort of the, the new person <laughs> to join. Well, no, I, I, I just think, you know, Susanna, when we discussed a number of months ago, I said, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to be out there at the fair. You know, I have, I have some previous experience with Freeze, right? I was advising uh, Freeze on their frame uh, section for several years. Uh, I, I think I did three, three times in London and two times in New York and also SPA, actually, which is a Sao Paulo art fair. I did a couple of solo sections there as well. And I think it's really interesting I think it's, it, I really believe that, that uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to put great people together in conversation. So that's why I really love the name of, of the section, Dialogues, right? So we can see several dialogues going on, right? The first, I think it's one dialogue that the museum has been able to enable through its program, through its mission, is this dialogue between art produced in the uh, Latin American, Caribbean, diaspora, and the United States with, with art produced uh, in, the, in the Latin American countries, right? So art from Latin America. So I think that's, that's, that's one interesting dialogue. But also I would say that I, I tried, you know, with, with like Alejandro Puente, for instance, that you were presenting about, I think that's really fascinating that he was creating work with a very strong Latin American component, but in the US, right, in the 70s. So really reacting uh, to US art, to minimal, to hard, hard edge abstraction, which was really on vogue in the 60s here, but making it more indigenous, making it more organic, making it more um, lived, more vital in a way. So I think this is, this is another thing you know, that we're trying to do. It's really use this as a way to reflect upon the museum program, to reflect upon what's, uh, what's possible for the museum to do and to reach in terms of curatorial speech, in terms of curatorial research. Uh, I think we did, a, uh, we did a great deal of traveling in the US because the research uh, um, for Dialogos, this year's Dialogos, 
was concomitant to the traveling research of, uh, of La Triennale, which is an exciting program we're doing uh, uh, soon. Uh, so we managed to go to places and visit artists or see exhibitions that are reflected uh, on, this, on this section in their presentations. So yeah, so that, that's it. And I would like also to add that uh, Dialogos brings complexity to the discussions around cultural identities. I like very much, for example, the fact that you choose um, uh, Ulises Carrion, who was Mexican, but he, he came from the field of literature. He went to live to Amsterdam and became a conceptual artist. And, and this, this complexity about this Mexican that was originally a writer that becomes a, a visual artist uh, doing a visual poetry and, and operates from a to totally different context as, as Amsterdam. I think this is really fascinating and interesting to, 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 to bring this, this um, um, as I was mentioned, complexity around how an artist can build his own identity, not, not, not only his identity, cultural identity, but also uh, the, the, the fact that he comes from one, from one field, shifts to another and, uh, and becomes something else. So uh, that was quite, quite interesting for me. Yeah, I want to just add to that, Patrick, that so many of these artists have that sort of trans um, disciplinary and transnational backgrounds. I forgot to mention that Jose Lerma, for example, is a perfect example born in Spain, raised in Puerto Rico, living in Chicago. Um, and so many of these artists, you know, moved between places, um, whether as in the case with um, Alejandro Puente or, or even Tesontle, who their practice is um, very much rooted in the particular place where they're making their work at that moment. I don't think I, I don't think I have to, so much to add, but I it's um, certainly it's it's really a conversation. It's really a dialogue. No, I think the the other uh, in terms of coming from one field to the other. You know, if you think of Mestre Gigi coming from the spiritual field, you know, producing originally those objects to in the in the in the context of of rituals and then being able to present them uh, as an artist, as a visual artist, that's, that's one, one, one of the most interesting things to me as well. But also the fact that El Museo is rooted in so much of the Afro-Caribbean heritage, right, of the, the, the Yoruba heritage. And so it's really a privilege to be able to present his work within this context. And if we don't have other questions, maybe Patrick, I'm happy to hand it back to you and you do the honors of, of uh, oh, well, everyone. Oh, thank you, yeah, thank you. And well, thank you once again uh, to our sponsor, Tequila Dobel. Thank you uh, all the friends and board members who join us in this uh, guided tour to free Dialogos. And please follow uh, El Museo's activities on elmuseo.org. Uh, El Museo en tu casa, it has a really, really rich program of different experiences, uh, virtual experiences. So thank you and uh, hasta la próxima. See you next time, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.